Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the replay. Welcome to the live show. If uh, uh, whatever you're doing, Dean and I are laughing here because if if you are on the live uh, live show, you're you're you don't realize that I just gave like three minutes of my like five minute spiel to a practice session of a webinar. Uh, apparently, <laughs> I forgot to hit the right button. So. <laughs> um but uh but welcome to the uh welcome to the webinar welcome to uh, um to our community table session as always we are streaming live on facebook i'm just double checking that all of this is good to go here we are there so uh so if you know anybody who is looking for um for for you know a quick access point you can point them to facebook as well uh the mission suite facebook page and as always this is being recorded and we'll be able to uh, to send this out um to youtube and it'll be on facebook and whatnot as well so um but uh but thank you for joining us and uh and today is a, is a fun day um dean and i did not call each other to discuss what color shirt we were wearing <laughs> um, that may be obvious to some of you uh but uh, uh but yeah so we uh but we're here and uh you know i'm in a i'm in a different location seemingly every month now um, you know, I actually, my, my family, uh, we bought a house in Southern Vermont. And so I am here in my new place, but we just closed on Wednesday and got our boxes on Friday. So I had to find some clear wall space, uh, that <laughs> didn't have boxes stacked up behind me, uh, to, uh, in order to, in order to get going here. But, uh, but we are, um, we are finally back in. In fact, my internet just got uh, just got turned on this morning. So all right, uh, good timing, about, great I timing. Know, right, seriously. <laughs> otherwise, I would have had to find a place to go. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, today's community table discussion. Uh, we're going to be talking about how understanding the buyer's journey can have a direct impact on your revenue. And uh, um, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're one person or a hundred people. How big or small you think you are, uh, the buyer's journey makes an impact on your uh, on your world and on your business, and so there's and there's reasons for that. Um, and we are going to kind of do a deep dive into this. Is actually um, kind of spawned from our last community table conversation a couple months ago when we touched on the buyer's journey, and and Dean and I have talked kind of talked a little bit about it. And we realized that you know we haven't really done a deep dive into the buyer's mm -hmm. journey in a while. Um, if at all, really. So we've we've mentioned it. We've kind of talked to we've we've referenced it a lot. Um, but now we're actually going to go deep into it and talk about why it makes such an impact. Um, so just some housekeeping first. My name is Ian Campbell. I'm the CEO of Mission Suite. Uh, joining me as always is Dean Isaacs. Uh, Dean is the founder of Vantage Group. It's a business growth strategy firm. He works with B2B companies, helping them grow predictable, profitable revenue and scale their organizations. And in 2018, he launched a gro the Growth Collaborative, which is a group consulting and mastermind program that helps B2B consultants and experts break through the revenue ceiling and generate high ticket clients month after month. And so that in and of itself is one of the reasons that uh, that he and I kind of talked a little bit about the fact that a lot of small business owners don't think about the buyer's journey and a lot of smaller, smaller, you know, kind of individual consultants and whatnot don't think about it. So uh, hopefully we'll uh, we'll we'll be changing that a little bit today. Um, so we're going to, uh, I know we're going to get a lot out of today's conversation, but before we jump in, uh, just do me a favor. If you have questions, um, you know, definitely ask them as we go. Uh, don't bother. You don't need to wait till the end. Um, you know, because oftentimes we go right up to the, to, to the, to the hour there, but, um, you know, let us, so as, as we go through here, uh, use that Q and a button inside of the zoom, use that Q and a feature. So we can kind of keep everything contained into one place and, uh, and let us know what kind of questions you have. Um, and with that, uh, let's kind of start a little bit about that. Let's just kind of dive into this a little bit here. Um, so, First things first, Dean, talk a little bit about what the buyer's journey is and just kind of give uh, give the overview of the umbrella that we're going to be walking under today. Yeah, so the buyer's journey, I think that term's been thrown out a lot over the years. And uh, traditionally, it's more about the, the journey that a buyer goes through on the website, right? They get to your website, they find stuff to buy, they click through and they, they check out. Well, the, really, the reality is the buyer's journey is much, much broader than that. So for me, the definition of the buyer's journey is it, it's the process that a buyer goes through from the moment they define a problem that's big enough 
in their business they want to spend time and money on to solve. That's where it begins. And it ends when they start working with a provider, where it actually goes beyond that in terms of like client growth and lifetime value. But for the sake of today, it's like this, this process. And it's, and I look at it from um, an empathetic standpoint, right? A lot of us marketers and sellers think the buyer's journey begins when a prospect kind of raises their hand, meaning they want a demo, they downloaded a white paper, they interacted with us some way. That's not where the buyer's journey actually begins. It begins, as I said, when, a, when a, someone in business defines that problem they want to solve. And it maps every step in the process from the buyer's side, from the empathetic side, from their side of the journey. Um, that's what the buyer's journey is. So it defines each step. And it also defines what the goal of the buyer is with each step. That's really, really important, right? So then we can get aligned with that. So that's, that's what the buyer's journey really is. Yeah. So dive a little bit deeper into that, the, the, the idea of the goal of the buyer at each step, right? Because, I mean, the goal of the buyer in, in traditional selling, the goal of the buyer is to solve a problem, right? Right. Um, right. But what you're saying when you talk about the goal, goals being different at each step, there's a lot more into, there's a lot, de there's a lot more deeper than that. Yeah, it, yeah, it is. It is a lot deeper. And and while the buyer wants to get to a point where they can solve that problem, really, that's the ultimate goal. They want to solve the problem. They don't go from, I've got a problem, to I solve the problem in one step. It doesn't work that way. Um, so they, they're taking these incremental steps. And, you know, we've talked a lot over the last few months about how modern buyers have changed the way they buy, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is that they are self-educating. It's like their own guided tour of figuring out how to do business right, and solve business problems. So each step in the buyer's journey mimics some of that. So this first step, just as an example, is problem recognition. They identify a, a thing they want to solve, a problem they want to solve in their business. The goal isn't to solve it then. The goal is just to get clear on what the heck the problem is and what impact it's having on the organization. Is it big enough for us to spend time and money on to solve? Where do we even start? Is it a software problem? Is it a people problem? Is it a systems problem? That's the first step. So mm -hmm. the goal of that first step is to really just like understand what's going on. So that's just an example. And each, each sort of step in that journey has its own unique goal that we have to, as sellers, align with because we want to get to the close. Yeah. Right. And the buyers want to make a decision, mm -hmm. but we have to be aligned with each of those steps. Otherwise, we kind of create this friction in the buyer seller relationship. Right. Right. OK. Yeah. Interesting. So, you know, you, you mentioned kind of empathy, right, being empathetic to to where a buyer is and what they're going through and, and what they're feeling from their perspective, not so much from ours. And, you know, I. I we talk there's been there's a lot of talk about uh uh what is it eq uh, instead of yeah. iq right emotional quote quote quotient or yeah. something like that. Yep. Yep. um you know is that kind of a is that is that similar to what we're talking about is that is is are these kind of in the same vein at all or well i think in, in terms of how you relate and communicate certainly right eq is all about adjusting your communication style to that individual that you're communicating with so i think that's that's part of it but for me it, it's 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 more than that. Yeah, it's really more systematic. Um, knowing that if a buyer, um, the first thing they do is they go to their network to ask for recommendations for service providers to solve a problem. If we know that's the first place they go, then we can be aligned with that. Mm -hmm. Now, how we communicate, how we can be you know, visible is a separate right. conversation. But so it's more about those mechanical steps and, and mm -hmm. aligning with the goals. Because what the, one of the best things that you can do is be at, in the right place at the right time, saying the right things, right? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, this sort of sales process becomes really easy all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. Well, you can do it by accident or you can do yep. it intentionally. And intentionality is all about building out each step in the process. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting, too, because, you know, we've talked about that you and I have had extensive conversations even outside of this, uh, the, the these conversations about how prospecting has changed. Right. And about uh, about the fact that cold calling doesn't work. Right. I mean, anymore. I uh, and I know there's going to be 
a bunch of people that rail against this and say, yes, you can find meanings in cold calling. And yes, that is true. But by and large, it's not as effective as it once was, right? I mean, you're not going to make 100 phone calls to get two appointments anymore. You're going to make 200 phone calls to get one appointment. And, you know, in fact, I've got, I've I've got anecdotal evidence of this that, you know, when I had a a sales guy working for me, he literally made, I want to say it was 450 phone calls before he, and, and he had like 10 conversations and set one appointment. Yeah. And it wasn't that he was bad at his job or wasn't able to talk to people. He just wasn't getting people answering the phone. Right. Because, and so he didn't even have a chance to own his, you know, own his pitch to get somebody out of a conversation yeah. because you know, everybody was just saying, send a voicemail, send a voicemail. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so this kind of a thing, this, the, these, you talk about the mechanical steps and the, the process, this is an important thing to really to, to dial in on because without this kind of a, without this perspective, you're not even going to get on the phone with somebody. You're just not going to get any connection, right? Whatever that is, whether it's a phone, email, you know, shine up at their office. Nobody does that anymore. You know, trade shows, digital, social, whatever the channel is, pick pick your channel, right? Mm-hmm. Are you in alignment with where they go to find the information that they need? Yeah. You know, I'll give you an example. I was speaking with... Um, a client not too long ago, we just started our engagement. And part of my my role was to help them really figure out this buyer's journey thing, right? What should they be doing in terms of marketing? How they should should they be engaging with their sales team? And they were really, they were right on the edge of signing a $10,000 a month Google AdWords contract, 120 grand a year. That's yeah. just in the ads, not even in the, the admin yeah. support fees, you know? Big, big dollars for these guys. <clears throat> and so I said, well, just let's take a pause. Let me talk to your clients. Let's figure out where they go to find resources like you're providing. If they go to the web, they start Googling stuff, they start searching, maybe they do click on an ad. Maybe PPC is the way to go. And so we did put a pause on it. And um, I talked to a bunch of their clients and not one of them does a generic, did a generic Google search for this solution. Mm. They went to their network. They went to their trade association, believe it or not. They went to their peer group to get recommendations and referrals. And then when they got a company name, they would Google the company. But then when you Google the company, you don't click on the ad, you go right to their homepage. And so really it was was a $100,000 savings by going through this process because that was one step in understanding the buyer. It's really about getting getting between the ears of your ideal prospect, right? right? Really understanding them. Label it buyer's journey, label it whatever you want. It's really understanding exactly how they think and what they do and how they do it. So we can just be in the right place, saying the right things at the right time. Yeah, man. Did you end up with uh, like get hate mail or end up with a horse's <laughs> head uh, in your bed from that from the agency that, uh, that they were about to sign <laughs> with? Funny. No, they ended up, they did actually engage with them on some SEO stuff. So they got, they got some work out of it. That was good. And, right, and, yeah. and since then, the client did do a little PPC, but it was more about testing messaging and some new markets, which is fine, right? You go into that knowing that that's a risky spend right. and not right. a guaranteed return. So, but yeah, yeah, it, they they weren't happy for a while. I hope. Yeah, I, was. <laughs> I would imagine so. I would imagine so. Um, so now you've got. Uh, I think now is probably a good time to kind of go through the 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 few slides that you have here, and yeah. yeah, that kind of shows what we're talking about. So we can kind of talk a little bit more in depth about the different stages and how they help. Because key the key thing here is to to talk about how this all this stuff can help build revenue. Yeah, for sure. So I, I, this is not going to be like this, you know, an hour long PowerPoint presentation, but I want to show show the audience how I start to think about and build out the tool, right? The actual buyer's journey itself, what it looks like, because I think that helps, you know, um, get some clarity. Uh, and because there are two sides to the buyer's journey that we'll look at, there's the buyer's journey, and then there's the seller's journey, mm-hmm. right? And they have to be really well aligned, because a lot of times, Smart people sit in a conference room and they say, here's how I'm going to market my stuff and here's how I'm going to sell my stuff. But they're not the person buying their stuff. <laughs> so you've got to get those things aligned. So, By the way, just- as an aside of that, if you've never seen on Instagram or Facebook, The Marketoonist, it's uh it's it's a great account. This Tom Fishburne, I think, is, is the, the cartoonist's name. 
and uh, it's a caricature of of, of marketers uh, having just that conversation. <laughs> yeah, uh, of, you know, hey, yeah. I think that we need to do this and we need to do that, and they're and people are going to buy. And then someone says, "Has anybody actually talked to our our customers?" And I said, "Never mind that. They'll they'll figure it out." <laughs> yeah, right. For right. sure, that's exactly. It's so true. Right. I laugh, but it's true. Yeah. All right. Um, can you Ian? Can you see my my slide? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is the, the sort of like the out of the box, typical stages of a buyer's journey, right? We've probably all seen this before. There's an awareness piece where marketing is out, um, doing outbound marketing, doing inbound marketing, social media posts, digital content, just putting our brand out into the world. And hopefully the hope is that someone that fits our ideal client profile will see it. That's awareness, right? And with that awareness, they start to inter interact with us, maybe ask for information, do demos, get on a sales call. Then the next step is consideration. They start to look for options and different solutions. They're weighing up, you know, company A to company B, what's going to be the best decision. And ultimately they make a decision. That's not, not true, right? But that's too generic. It's like saying, I'm going to, I want to go to LA. Well, I need to get on the freeway. I need to head West and I'll get to LA. Okay, yes. well, yeah, it's not not true, <laughs> right? But you know, there's there's a lot left to uh, the imagination here. So what I do is I break the buyer's journey down into a lot more detail, and, and that information does come from my clients' clients. I talk to their clients. I get direct conversations going with them because it, while I could probably have a pretty good guess after doing this for so many years, again, I'm not the buyer. They're the buyer. So I, it, this is all driven by client research and client interviews. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So just for this example, and we'll have, we'll share this document with everybody mm -hmm. on the call today when, when we're done at the end. But I've taken that three generic steps of the buyer's journey and broken it down into about eight steps here. And this is what a typical buyer of B2B services, the steps they go through. But keep in mind, every organization is different right? Every decision-making process is a little different, but this gives you a sense of the level of detail that you need to think about when you build out your buyer's journey. So across the top, we've got um, the problem recognition, right? As we talked about, that's where it all begins. Businesses are thinking about the problems they need to solve. Then they start looking for solutions. Then they start having preliminary dialogue. And I will say preliminary dialogue doesn't mean a sales call, right? Because we're self-educating, it could be they're watching your videos, they're on your YouTube channel, they're on your social media, they're downloading white papers, they're doing research, they're, they're interacting with your brand and you may not even realize it. They're learning about what you do and how you do it because they're going to shortlist and only talk to those one or two providers they think can really solve the problem. They're going to yeah. be 60, 70% through their process before they ever raise their hand for a, to, to sign up for a sales call, mm -hmm. right? So there's a lot there. So once, you, once they've done that and they want to have the interaction, there's some kind of demo, right? You're As a salesperson, we're going to demo our stuff. We're going to do a sales pitch. We're going to present our expertise. Then what do they want to know? What's it going to cost me, right? They want a proposal. Usually they want that information like before. Yeah, the back in the summer, dialogue, right? Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> but a good salesperson won't give that up. Exactly, right. right? So uh, And there's a lot more to the proposal than just cost, but that's a big piece of it. And then the buyer says, okay, we've got these two or three proposals on our desk. We need to like weigh them up. Somebody usually is the champion within your prospect business to make that buying decision or make the recommendation. And then ultimately there's an approval that happens. Yeah. So those are all kind of logical steps in the process. If you were buying yourself, you would go through something similar. Mm -hmm. But what's more important than the steps are the objectives that they go through. Now, I will say that each objective isn't exactly aligned with each step because it's a, a blended process, right? Sell, selling is not this one, two, three process anymore. It's more of a, a spider web of activities. Mm -hmm. But keep in mind these objectives. The first thing they're trying to do is they're just sizing the problem. Yeah. Right? I need to spend 30000 bucks to solve this $4,000 issue. Probably not going to do it. And it's obviously more than just, just cost. What are the impacts? You, you'll see in this document... Um, an acronym PBO, which is positive business outcomes. Those are the results we want to see by making a change, the future result, right? Positive business outcomes. 
So they'll, they'll, as we talked about, self-education. They're going to do their research. They're going to understand the problem. They're going to look at different solutions. Do they want to go one direction or another? There's always ways to solve problems, right? Different ways to solve problems. They're going to get to this point where they want to validate solutions. What that really means is they're going to talk to different providers and see what is your approach? How do you go about solving this thing? And from that position, they're going to shortlist. That's when they want to get into the proposal. And, and they don't want to propose just because they need to know the cost. They've got to justify the spend internally. Remember, we want to be empathetic. Mm -hmm. So they've got to justify their spend. You know, we've got really clear on what the requirements are, what the outcomes are, and they have to seek internal support for making that purchase. Even if it's a single business owner, solopreneur, that person probably is talking to somebody else right. inside or outside of their business to get to get um, sort of like um, a gratification that they're going to make the right decision. Or so, in, we, I mean, in sales, we've talked a lot. I mean, it's kind of been the, the the general consensus that people buy based on emotion and justify it on logic. So even yeah. if they are just themselves and they're not having ex conversations, they need that logic to be able to justify it, right? And that's and, what I'm understanding that this justification is. Totally right. And it actually rolls into the evaluation. So they're trying to justify the purchase, then evaluate who they're going to go with. And this last little um, few words here, what feels best for us, right? They're going to make comparisons. They're going to look at approaches and costs and timelines and all of this stuff. But ultimately, they're going to. They, they, we are humans and we do make emotional decisions. So yep. what feels best for us? Right. And then ultimately they're going to make a decision. And that's, and I, I say it's champion led, meaning you can't just have a point of contact at your client. You have to create a champion for your calls and theirs. And there's a big difference between just having a point of contact and developing a champion. The champion will carry your flag, will sell you upstream, will differentiate you from the competition mm -hmm. in your prospects organization. Versus a point of contact is just going to say, here's three bids, boss. Which one should we go with? Right. Completely different. So that's the sort of level of detail that we need to think about as we develop our buyer's journey. It's all about the buyer and their goals and objectives for each step in the process. Yeah. You know, while we're on this, you know, we talked about the, you know, awareness, consideration, decision uh, steps of kind yep. of the general sales process. You know, I mean, it may, it may sound obvious, but just in case anybody's asking themselves uh, questions, can you kind of align or just walk through each of these steps and align wh where they where they fall inside of that or where they yeah. typically fall inside of that? Yeah, so awareness is going to be problem recognition, solution search, and starts blending into preliminary dialogue, right? They're just trying to figure out what the options are. Right. Consideration is where they start looking at your, really looking at your solution who you are, your cost, your delivery, your methodology. So that's going to be preliminary dialogue, product demo proposal, and then evaluation is the whole consideration decision, right? Is right. That, that, that third step. Mm -hmm. And I will say that every step sort of blends into the next. There's no clear end and beginning, which is why I believe that there's no, there's no clear definition in, in, in terms of activity with marketing and sales. It's right. a blended approach, right? We need sales needs marketing support, even all the way down to the last steps in the buying process, right? Marketing can support with the right kind of collateral, maybe an email campaign, maybe a, 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 um, a video testimonial. Those are marketing assets that sales can use. So it's a blended approach because we we take a blended approach to making decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Okay. Excellent. Excellent. So, so that's the, yeah, that's the buyer's journey piece. Right? Yeah. I, I think you were, go ahead. That's what I was just going to ask is, so where do these align with us as salespeople? Yeah. So that's my, my, my next slide here is it brings up the next chunk of information. And I know there's a lot on the screen, which is why I kind of brought it up in pieces. So now we think about the seller's journey, right? We typically, as a business owner, we want to market to generate leads, we want to talk to those prospects and we want to close deals. Well, again, you know, it's more, there's more steps in the process than that. So each of the blue arrows are the stages of the seller's journey, right? It's not just the marketing strategy on the sales process. It's, it's the journey we go through with our buyer. That's really important to understand. We want to go from this consultative 
selling approach, selling across the desk to this collaborative selling approach where we're sitting on the same side of the desk, experiencing the journey together, mm -hmm. right? Which is why we want to align our activities. So when we think about revenue generation, the first thing we have to do is create awareness. People have to know that when they're recognizing a problem and searching for a solution, they're aware that we exist. Mm -hmm. So those two green arrows and this one blue arrow have to align. So when we think about our goals and our approach, our goal with awareness and engagement is just to draw them into our messaging ecosystem. And what I mean by that is get them into our world, get them on a webinar, have them download something, go see if we can get them to the website to learn more. They're just kind of kicking the tires. They're trying to figure out, are you even a potential for solving this problem, right? That's all awareness is about, right? Yeah. And if we've done a good job with awareness, they're going to engage with our brand, right? They're going to sign up for that webinar, maybe ask for a sales conversation, consultation, whatever you do. Um, real, real quick, under each of these, I've kind of created some... These are our goals as, as marketers and sale, sellers. Remember, they have to align with the objectives of the buyer. So for us, we want to get them into our messaging ecosystem. We want to show them a new point of view, a different way. If we're all CPAs selling the same old accounting services, we're all, I have a buddy that says, we all look like, imagine a bag of coffee beans. You pour those coffee beans out onto a desk. All the coffee beans look the same. Right. All CPAs look the same. All attorneys look the same. All digital marketers look the same. So we have to show them a new point of view, a way to look at their problem. Remember, they're sizing the problem differently, right? If you've got a, an approach, give it a name, give it a brand, make it feel proprietary and different. Mm -hmm. And take a stand means take a stand for your, your recommendations, right? If you're, you're giving the same advice as everybody else, you're no different. You're not going to stand out when they're out looking for solutions. So then we go from this awareness to engagement and discovery. That means when we can have a conversation and as salespeople, we get pumped up, right? We're going to lead that actually wants to talk to us. Woo! What do we do? Uh, we go through this generic, tell me about your problem conversation. Right. So all the hard work we did in standing out during awareness falls apart with engagement and discovery because they're not asking unique different questions. So the goal here is we want to share new perspectives. Again, we're trying to stand out from the crowd. Mm -hmm. So provide some insights. A lot of salespeople want to be seen as subject matter experts or thought leaders. And they do that by sharing all of this information. It's like one of the best ways to provide insights that build trust is ask thought provoking questions. So ask and don't just tell. Right. Um, and then we move on to discovery and then into the solution phase. And I want to touch on solution and proposal because I think that those are two different steps that we should address in selling that align with proposal and evaluation on the buyer's side. So solution is about, well, let me back up for a second. The proposal should never be a surprise. When you, when you, when you, when they get the proposal, they should never be surprised about the solution you're recommending, mm -hmm. your approach, or your cost. If they are, you've missed the whole solutioning conversation. And the goal of solutioning is, obviously, you want to define impacts and value and align with their future state and, and positive business outcomes. But more importantly, test drive your recommendations. Float those things by them in these early discovery calls. Get them thinking about how you can solve the problem, how they can see you solving the problem. The ultimate, ultimately, the proposal is just a confirmation and documentation of the prior conversations. They've already agreed to the price. They've already agreed to your approach. The proposal is just that document that, that, that like lays it all out. Right. So solution and proposal or propose are two separate steps. And I, and I will say, never send a proposal. Never send a proposal. Never send a proposal. And that seems like, well, they want a proposal. They ask for a proposal. They need it. I'm not saying don't give them a proposal. I'm saying never send it. Now, whether you have a, pro a quote, a proposal, an SOW, whatever you call it, never, ever just send it. Get a time on the calendar with them and go through it. Even if it's 15 minutes, 
Mm -hmm. You get an opportunity to interact with them again. You get an opportunity to answer their questions and you get an opportunity to set um, agreed upon next steps. The worst thing that you can ever do is send it and hope. Hey, Ian, here's the proposal you asked for. Let me know if you have any questions. <laughs> How many times does that happen a day? I've got to imagine it's millions of times a day. And then salespeople are like, I'm getting ghosted. They're not getting back to me. Yeah, so right. They have the information they need. They don't need you anymore. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole process around that, but never just send the proposal. Use it as an opportunity to dig deeper, to build relationships, to get feedback and get an agreed upon next step. Well, and I mean, you know, we talked about collaborative selling last month or last time. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they, it seems like the two go hand in hand, right? I mean, if you're actually going to collaborate on something, you want to be able to actually talk through pricing and what it includes and whatnot and not just kind of bullet it out, right? hundred percent. And, and I always tell my clients, it's always a draft until it's agreed upon, right? right? Even if we've discussed it, even if we've got a verbal on, yeah, this is the approach and this is the cost and this is the timeline. Yep, send me the document. I will still put draft on it mm -hmm. and have a conversation. I don't care if I've spent 10 hours discussing it. I'm still not going to send the proposal. Right. Because I'm also, I also want to know, are they willing to share that extra little bit of time with me? Because if they're not, are they really serious? Or are they just kind of getting information where they can just say, All right, I've got three bids. I'm really going to go over here anyway, right? Right, right. There's a lot. There's a lot to never send a proposal. That's really important. But it actually does align with the buyer's journey because, as we talked about, they want they want to feel like they've been empowered to make a decision, mm -hmm. and having an extra conversation gives them that power. Right. Okay. And then the very last step in the in the seller's journey is this stage of approval, which we often feel like we have no control over. But I will say, as a seller, you're not done. You're never done. Because they may need one more piece of reassurance, right? That last, do you have one more reference? Do you have one more testimonial? Tell me a little about that thing. Right. We always get that hidden objection right at the end. So be ready for that one more thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then be assumptive and start prepping them for kickoff. Getting them into that kickoff mindset is really important. Because sometimes no decision will kill the deal. Yeah. But if you get them moving towards a kickoff, an implementation, you could often get past that no decisions or sticking point. Right. So that's the buyer's journey. Just again, very generic, right? But hopefully that gives the audience a sense of what this thing should look like. This last little section at the bottom, the blue there, these are sort of content themes and tools that you should be prepared for, for each step. And I won't read through all of this stuff, but have your material ready. Have your content ready. Know what your buyer is going to ask for because you know, based on what their objectives are, the information they need. So mm -hmm. be ready. Don't scramble around pulling together a one-pager. It should already be done. You already right. know that at a particular point in their journey, they're going to ask for this thing. So be proactive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So, uh, you know, it occurs to me that as we're kind of talking through this, that, you know, at last week we talked about or last time we talked about collaborative selling and how you can get better deals and you know bigger deals and, and get your clients to buy more often things like that it seems to me like there are some specific opportunities in the buyer's journey to kind of really dive in on that and uh, dive in on that collaborative aspect of it and then help to actually kind of you know even chip up the what you would initially propose for to other things right i mean yep. is that and, and is that a is that is that a real opportunity that you should be taking advantage of or is that kind of the skeezy sales guy that nobody wants to be kind of uh thing where does that fall there no that i mean that falls right in the middle it falls right in the middle of the buyer's journey and the selling process um and there's a great book called gap selling is by a guy named keenan and he talks about current state mm -hmm. and future state and we're selling the gap, which is the solution, right? It gets them from point A to point B. And so we spend often, we often spend too much time either focusing on the current pain. We've got to focus on pain, 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 pain. And we don't spend enough time on this future state, where they're going. And so for, for, a, for a buyer, they need to be really clear, clear on 
what is the positive? What, what is the outcome of us doing this thing and solving this problem? Is it just going to eliminate pain or is it going to create gain? Right. And if so, how are we going to measure the benefit of that gain? That's what a positive business outcome is. Mm -hmm. And so as sellers, we have to draw that out of the buyer and let them describe their value. It's not what, how we define value. It's how they define value that counts. And so kind of coaching them through that process actually creates more opportunity for us. It may uncover more things that we can do. And it may uncover the, the, um, the bigger um, value to the organization. It may solve this individual's problem, but it may have a ripple effect on the whole organization. So our proposal is actually going to be a much smaller spend comparative to the bigger win, if you will. So we have to guide them through that process. And, and in my world, it always opens up additional opportunities for conversations, whether it's stuff that I can provide mm -hmm. or I can refer to my strategic partners and open right. up opportunities for them too. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So if I'm looking at this, because we talked a little bit about, you know, obviously, I mean, and to the audience, if uh, for, for those of you that are listening, if you have, uh, I, I encourage you to think about questions and specific uh, specific things here too, if you have any. But uh, but as we kind of look at this, we talked a little bit about how it can help you, how it can help you actually generate more revenue, right? I mean, at the end of the day, for, if I'm understanding this correctly, it's just going to help you close deals more effectively, right? Yep, close more deals more more quickly, uh -huh. and also avoid a lot of the price objections that come up, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Because price objections come up when you haven't created enough value in the mind of the buyer, right? right? We may have done all the communicating in the world, but if they really haven't got it, and if it doesn't come from them, then it's not true. Right. So by going through this process and getting um, clarifying and then kind of getting feedback, it becomes their idea. Right. Right. They've defined value. They've defined, is it worth doing this or not? And, and, and what we find is that the price objection just basically disappears. It's mm -hmm. not even part of the conversation. Right, right. And oh, I, the question I was going to ask just, just, uh, just fell out of my head. Uh, so, and that's because that is, uh, the, oh, the, um, helps you close, close better deals more effectively. More quick, I said more quickly as more well. More quickly, right? Yeah, exactly. Right, right. Um, yeah. Well, hopefully it'll come back to me. But, <laughs> uh, but and then, you know, obviously, say, oh, that's it. And saving time too, right? Because I've talked to God knows how many salespeople who have, who, I mean, and you kind of touched on this a, a little bit, but I think it's an important one to, to, to really dive in on is that, you know, you're not going to be wasting time trying to force an engagement or force a, a discovery conversation into somebody that's just trying to figure out what the problem is. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And so that aligns both in the buyer's journey, right? This, this whole purpose of a preliminary dialogue mm -hmm. is I'm still trying to figure out the problem. Right. Are you someone that could really help me? And if so, how? Mm -hmm. And then that goes right into our discovery process where we are trying to understand and align. And I and I actually had a bullet point in, in here and I removed it because I wanted to kind of get some of the extra stuff out of there. And it was, don't forget, qualify in or out. Right. And it has to happen early. Mm -hmm. Right. Don't get to proposal and they're like, oh, I only had five grand and your proposal is 50 grand. Don't get, you should never get there. You should never find yourself in that spot if you've done a good job early on with discovery. But part of discovery is saying, thanks, Ian, love you, man, but I don't think we're a fit. Right. And the, you do that earlier. The most successful salespeople are the ones that qualify out quickly because they spend time on the things that are going to have a higher likelihood of closing. Right. Right. Absolutely. Well, and it helps to, it helps you to, to open up time to go find more truly qualified prospects right so absolutely yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I'm, and, gonna, you know, I'm gonna stop sharing this but i can certainly bring it up again if anybody yeah. wants to see it and you know it's so because i mean another thing that, that that comes to mind is that as salespeople, we're all we all think to ourselves at least every salesperson that i thought to myself i am absolutely willing to walk away from a deal if it's not a good fit right but those are the same salespeople who preach that, that bring me that, you know, will bring deals, bring, whether it's to me or to whomever, but bring deals that, that you know, you say, 
how why did i just have to refund this guy five hundred dollars or <laughs> whatever right who because i mean obviously he's not a good fit right so, but why how, so but why 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 are we doing this what 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 happened here and it seems like not understanding the journey here not understanding where uh, and really diving into all these pieces is the is is the biggest it tends to be the biggest problem right it, it, it is and it kind of comes back to two i think two things there one is do you, do your sales people really know what a qualified lead is mm -hmm. can they absolutely quantify a qualified lead have we defined and documented what a qualified lead looks like what are those characteristics and traits what are the things we have to know to say yes or no to otherwise right. it's like well they don't really fit our client profile, but they're willing to spend money. They're qualified, yeah, right? You right, know, exactly. right? The, the, the ability to spend money doesn't make them qualified or not. That's not a goal. That's not it. So as a business owner or a sales leader, we have to be really clear and document what does qualified look like mm -hmm. and then hold the reps accountable to understanding that and bringing that data back so we can take a look. So there is no question. So that, that's the first thing. I think the other thing is, again, thinking empathy. Mm -hmm. right being in the shoes of the buyer and collaborative we talked about that too this the first sort of part of the dance is really about helping them understand as much as us understanding and having that relationship and saying look i don't know if we're a fit we may not be and that's okay you're still trying to figure out your stuff i'm trying to figure out my stuff let's kind of come together in a really open conversation and go through this together Mm -hmm. right collaborate on the process um it takes more time it does yeah. there's more touch points there's more communication it takes more time which may mean more money uh, more money spent but it ultimately results in a better quality outcome where well, even if it's a no that's okay i'm okay with that and so it you the empathy thing is so important because we we talk empathy but we don't always demonstrate it at the end of the day we want to close something we want business not if you're going to refund it, right? Or they're going to be right. that, you know, that pain in the butt client. So right. the more we can communicate our approach to this discovery, the better off we are. And, I, and there are there are times where I would tell salespeople, don't call it discovery. Right. It sounds too salesy. But if you describe discovery as you're discovering about us and we're discovering about you to see if we're a fit, Mm -hmm. then it sounds a little more equitable, right? It doesn't sound so salesy. And it's really like open book. And right. I think that's really important because the modern buyers want to be open. They want to communicate once they've built trust. Sure. So discovery obviously is, is something that that salespeople have the tendency to gloss over and to kind of rush through, if you will. What are some of the other uh, steps along the buyer's journey that you've, that you've seen salespeople be most likely to kind of push far to push forward too quickly really understanding the decision making process without alienating your point of contact so okay. you're my point of contact and i say ian who else is involved in the decision making process what it's what i'm saying to you is you're not really important your boss is the one i really need to get to right right I just alienated you that's not how to address that right but if you ask them, what are the next steps? They will share with you the next steps. Right. Right. You're not asking about the next steps in making a decision. You're not asking about the next steps in just defining. Just whenever you're done with that first piece of the conversation, where do we go from here? What are the next steps? Leave it open. They will share with you. Well, I've got to go talk to this person. I've got another thing over here. Just be, don't use sales jargon. Right. Just be open. Like, Dude, what do you? What's next for you? Yeah, right. Yeah. We don't spend enough time building a relationship, so we have the right to ask those questions. But when, when, as I said, when salespeople try and figure out who's really behind writing the check, they mm -hmm. alienate out their alienate their point of contact instead of making them the champion. Right. Right. Interesting. Yeah. So as I go through the, as, as, you know, as a business owner, as I go through this and I start building out my own <clears throat> buyer's journey, kind of figure that out, where should I, outside of downloading the, the PDF document that, uh, that, that will 
that we can actually we'll probably put it up in the chat. Um, yeah. We've got that. Uh, is that link that you sent me uh, the the share link? Is that yeah? It's just it, you download the PDF from the Google Drive. Yeah. Perfect. So uh, so to anybody that would like it, I just added the. Uh, oh, I think I just went to panelists here. I'll actually send this to everyone. Someday I'll learn how to use Zoom. It's almost like we haven't been on it for the <laughs> past. Supposed to stay on Zoom, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, and we'll and we'll make sure to add that in the co in the comments of the of the um, in the description of this of the the videos recordings of this as well. But um, but as I'm looking to go through this outside of downloading this and kind of trying to tr trying to assess this, what are my steps if I'm going to build out my own buyer's journey? What are the steps that I should be taking in order to do so? Yeah, that's a that's really where the rubber meets the road at the beginning of this whole process, right? Um, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, the source of information are your clients. Mm -hmm. They just are. And if you don't have any clients because you're really early in business or you don't have many, talk to your prospects, the ones that really do fit your ideal client profile. And I would say, and so I do a lot of this client interviewing stuff for clients and getting feedback. And there's a benefit to having a third party person do it, whatever, right? That's, that is what it is. But it doesn't discount you having conversations with your clients. And I would say, his, I'm going to give you five what seem like really basic, generic questions, right? So if you're on the call, get your pen ready. Five questions that you should ask your clients to start to get an understanding of the steps they go through when you build out the buyer's journey. So the first one is, how did you find us? Right. Sometimes we do that with a prospect when they first sort of come into the sales farm. Well, how did you find us? Well, we Googled you. We did this. Ask them again, because you may get different information when they're an actual client, because then now they trust you and will give you the scoop. Right. Initially, as a lead, they'll say, I Googled you or somebody told me about you or I saw a post generic information. Ask them again. How did you find us? OK. Um, second question is. Why did you pick us over the other people you were looking at? Dig into it. Dig into that. When they give you answers, ask them why. Dig in. Don't be a survey, meaning they mm -hmm. answer your question and you move on. Dig down into the, below the surface. So why did you select us? Third question is, um, what was the process like that you went through when you evaluated us and the other companies? What was that process like? Describe that for me. Where could we improve? What about your on? But once you decided to buy from us, what was the onboarding process like? Mm -hmm. Right. Get their feedback on that. Um, the next question is: um, During this whole journey you went through with us, were there ever questions that you couldn't get answered that you hoped for, that you wanted to get answers to? Right. Was there anything that you asked that we couldn't provide? or you search for and you couldn't find, or we gave you an answer, but it really didn't give you the response you wanted. So what questions could you not get answers to? And then the last question is, why do you stay with us? Right? Because sometimes people make a buying decision and they're like, that didn't work out. I'm moving on. <laughs> right. Why do you stay with us? So those are five basic questions. I would say if you want to add another layer, you can ask a question like, when you have a problem in your business, where do you go to find solutions? Mm -hmm. What's the first place you go to? How do you find new resources? And they're going to say, well, I asked my network for referrals. What kind of people do you go to? Who do you, do you go to your accountant, your attorney? Do you go to your trade association? Do you go to your net, your, your peers in a networking group? Where do you go? Yeah. Who are the people you get you know referrals from? So you, there's there's lots of questions you can ask, but think about the, the engagement points, the contact points in your seller's journey, and what information do you need to get aligned with your buyer? And just build questions around that. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because, I mean, you can obviously, as, as you talk through these questions, you know, how did you find out about us and, uh, you know, what everything to what questions weren't you able to answer, you can kind of see where those things are aligned with those aspects of the buyer's journey. Um, how, 
you know, I think one of the things that a lot of people get concerned about when they're asking these questions or doing these kind of having these conversations is how invasive should I get, right? And uh, and how deep should I try to go if someone just gives me the standard? Well, I googled you, and that's how I found you. Excuse Don't me. Take, so, yeah, you got to dig. Yeah, you got to dig. What did you Google? Mm, okay. What, what search term did you use? Right. What did you plug into Google to find us, right? It, Googling is no, because they could have said, oh, Ian told me about you. So I just put your, your company name in there. Right. That's completely different to searching for a type of solution or a type of problem we need to solve. Mm -hmm. So you, you've got to dig. Um, there's this whole theory of you've got to ask seven layer deep questions to get to the truth. Mm -hmm. And I'm not suggesting you hammer your clients with you know hundreds of questions, but dig a little deeper. And if you've right. got a relationship and trust with them, you build trust with them, they're going to give it to you. They're going to give you what the information they think you, you're looking for. But if it's not, dig in a little more. Mm -hmm. And I would also say, don't have your salesperson do this. Have somebody that wasn't involved in the sale ask these questions. Right? Why? Why? Well, because they, people tend to not want to hurt other people's feelings. Right. Sure. And if me as a salesperson, I missed a few steps and it wasn't quite right, even if I did buy it, they're probably not going to tell me directly, usually. But if you have somebody in customer service or anywhere in your business, it could be you as the owner. Right. It could be really powerful as an owner to get feedback. Right. Um, you get more um, you get more truthful and, and, and usable information. Because yeah. and when I start these interviews with clients, I, I always tell them, you know, my client who I'm calling on behalf of, they're not going to know what who who said what. They're just going to know what was said. Right. And so you can have that same policy internally. If you have somebody internally calling a client, you can tell them, give that person the authority to say to the client, I'm not going to divulge that you said it, just we right. want the information. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that lowers their barrier for like really getting into the weeds. And I'm not looking for good information and pats on the back. I'm not right. looking for bad information and criticism. I'm just looking for feedback. Yeah. Right. Interesting. So how often do you uh, do you have conversations with people who say, yeah, there were five questions that nobody could answer for me, but I moved ahead with them anyway? Very rarely. Yeah. Right? Because if buyers, the modern buyer is a self-educator, they right. need answers to their questions, whether it's from your website, your social feeds or talking to a salesperson, they will get frustrated and move on. Mm hmm. If they don't get the answers they're looking for, well, they don't get they don't get response to the questions. Right? They may not like their response, but they get a, they need that information. So that's really really important because if you start to see a trend of the types of questions they ask of you, you can build content around that. Mm -hmm. Right? You can overcome those hidden objections in the sales process, close more deals by being proactive in sharing that information. Yeah, you know. I have clients all the time and I say, you know, a lot of clients in your situation ask me these kinds of things or are trying to solve these kinds of questions. Does that, does that resonate with you? Great. Let's dig into that. They may not have thought of those questions themselves. So that proactivity that, you know, providing the right information at the right time. Right. It, it absolutely will incre increase your close rate and your bottom line. And you yeah. get that information from these questions. Very cool. Very cool. You know, and, and it's interesting because as you, you know, as you go through these things, what I've noticed and what I've seen, you know, just being in the CRM world, what I've seen in the past before is that there are people who kind of use that, that a lot, there are some particularly high performers that use these different steps along their, their journey as their opportunity phases right as the st different stages of opportunities which is which is awesome but then beyond that it also turns out it also helps to create a, a great sales training tool for new people to come on yeah. as you grow right because you can take the questions that and the information that you that you know that excuse me that your buyer is going to ask your buyer needs right and you can make sure that those that you can make those fields inside of your crm you can do those things and so that every so that if it's a question that you need answered you can you know you know that 
Okay, the inside of this cluster here is are these 10 questions and you need to be doing that. And then, you know, and then you can move on to the next stage, but it's not until you finish that, finish all of these questions that you're ready to move on to the next stage, right? Is that? So, yeah, that's huge. So everybody that has a CRM has some kind of pipeline, right? Whether it's the generic out of the box, 10 steps that Salesforce force feeds us or something that's a little more customized to your world. But what most people miss is what is going to be achieved by the salesperson to get to the next step. Right. Well, if your sales steps in the sales process are aligned with the steps in the buyer's journey, and we know that under like solution, solution search, your prospect needs to get to this point to get to the next step. That's our gate. That's what we need to do. We need to help them get to the next step. So it aligns with the buyers and the seller stages. Our objectives are aligned. Mm -hmm. and we move things along yeah and the questioning is is huge right it's it's what questions do you ask when and how often and getting those into your crm mapping that out that right. starts to create a sales playbook for your team then you get repeatable predictable results as well so it's right. it's right. hugely important yeah yeah and yeah i mean you can score off of that you can do, do scoring off that information yeah so getting all this information is and being and, and having these interactions because even if it's just a did you do this or are they okay or are, 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 are they comfortable with your response to whatever yes or no right i mean that can be a 50 100 point question and then you know you all of a sudden you're you're finding the people that are really you know that that are really players in your game and you're able to uh to, to move to continue to push people through yeah yeah the, uh, when you think about presenting price right that's always well many times that's where deals fall apart right because the prospect is surprised at the cost yeah because the salesperson's avoid, avoided talking about money right. because they per personally perceived the price is too high yeah uh -huh. so they kill the deal themselves but if you've gone through discovery and solution and started to lay the groundwork and even if you've laid out you know this range this big wide range of cost and you've got the feedback then when you get through the process you start narrowing that range down to a number that makes some sense it's yeah. never it's not a surprise that's why the proposal should never be a surprise it's just a confirmation of all the prior conversations we've had right. but we know that the buyer wants scope they want cost those are the things they want from the rep that's it can you solve our problem and how and right. how much is it going to cost me that's it. That's really what they care about. And once we've given that to them, they don't need you anymore as a salesperson. Yeah, so right, you have to exactly. pass out that information over time in a way that creates collaboration. So, you know, don't give it up too soon. Yeah, because I mean, if you do it collaboratively, then by the time that they, you get to price and whatnot, then just human nature is going to make them want to work with you to either, even if it's just to get you to, to, to get themselves off of your list, right? Because if it's not a good fit and their boss says, oh, well, no, we can't do it, whatever, blah, blah, you know, I mean, that 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 sense of collaboration is going to drive them to say to to be more responsive to you and not just ghost you and say, listen, you know, work, we're, I mean, we're comfortable with the price and, and everything that you've done is good. But right now, for whatever reason, it's just not the right time. So we have we, you know, we're not going to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. And it's going to make that no come out a lot easier, I would imagine than uh, than it would otherwise yeah it would because that the collaborative process builds a relationship builds trust and it actually puts them at your debt right, right. because you've given them a lot you've shared there they become the subject matter expert for your solution right. in their business right so that elevates them in their peer group and with their boss and all that so they owe you a little bit and they know that yeah they know that versus you just try to qualify them and sell them a can package of stuff right right completely different relationship so start with talking to your clients get that feedback and only care about them to start with only mm -hmm. think about the stages they go through the objectives they're trying to um, achieve just start there don't worry about marketing strategy and selling process and all this forget all that understand the buyer's journey first and then you can back into how you want to market and sell yeah. But sometimes we get kind of crowded and we just kind of do both at one time. Just that green section of the document we'll send you guys is where you want to start. Yeah. That's that's it. That, that's my sort of advice is start being be more empathetic. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I think that answers the the typical last question of, well, you know, what's one thing that, that, that everybody should take away from. So, uh, but yeah, being more empathetic and kind of, and, and f f figure out how to meet them where they are is, is, totally. is what I'm understanding. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, this has been great. We are at the top of the hour here, so we will, uh, we'll wrap up, but, uh, but thank you everybody for, uh, for joining us today. Hope that you got a lot out of it. And uh, again, this will be available on, on Mission Suites YouTube channel and Facebook channel. And, you know, Dean's going to be parsing it out and sending it on his channels too, as I know. And uh, so keep uh, keep an eye out for things. If you want to share it with people, uh, we will have the link to that, uh, to that document available in uh, the comments on Facebook and in the description on YouTube. So, uh, so if you wanted to, to share that too, go ahead and do so. And uh, yeah, well, thank you so much for joining us and we will see you next time around. Cheers.